If a man in a uniform told you to press a button that you believed would seriously hurt someone, would you do it? Before you say no too quickly, let me tell you about one of the most shocking psychology experiments of all time. You're gonna get a shock, 180 volts. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're diving into Milgram's controversial research on obedience to authority. We're going to look at what he found, the variations that changed how people behaved, and the ethical and scientific debates that continue today. What Milgram discovered forces us to ask an uncomfortable question. Could we do the same? Let's go back in time to World War II. One of the high-ranking Nazi officers was this man, a man called Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was responsible for the deportation of millions of Jews to the death camps. When Nazi Germany was finally defeated by the Allied forces, Adolf Eichmann fled to Argentina. It wasn't until 1960 that Israeli Mossad agents captured him so that he could stand trial in Jerusalem in 1961 for crimes against humanity. What shocked the world wasn't just what he did, but how he explained it. He said, in essence, I was only obeying orders. He wasn't some crazed villain. He was ordinary, organised, polite. And that's what horrified people most. One writer called this the banality of evil. It raised a terrifying question. Could ordinary people, just like you and me, commit atrocities if told to by someone in authority? After World War II, the question on people's lips was why did the Germans and the Nazis do what they did? Many people proposed that the Germans were just different. There was something about them as people that made them more likely to do something as horrific as the Holocaust. But Milgram wanted to test this idea and asked if an authority figure told someone to harm another person, how far would they go? Milgram recruited 40 men aged 20 to 50 from the local area using an advert in a newspaper. A wide range of occupations was represented in the sample. They were told they'd take part in a study on memory and learning held at Yale University, a highly impressive and respected university. They were paid $4 an hour for their participation in the experiment experiment and they were told that payment was simply for coming to the laboratory and that the money was theirs no matter what happened after they arrived. When they arrived each met another participant who was actually a confederate, an actor secretly in on the experiment. They drew lots to decide who would be the teacher and who would be the learner but this was rigged. The real participant was always the teacher. The learner, the confederate, was then strapped into a chair with wires attached to their wrists. The teacher sat in the next room with a shock generator, a device with switches marked from 15 volts, slight shock, all the way to 450 volts, danger. The task, if the learner gave a wrong answer to a memory test, the teacher had to give them a shock, increasing the voltage each time. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong, 150 volts, answer, horse. What the teacher didn't know was that the shocks weren't real. The learner was acting. In reaction to the electric shocks, the learner, who was actually an actor, began to grunt at 75 volts. At 120 volts, he voiced complaints, and by 150 volts, he was asking to be released. As the voltage increased, his pleas became more intense. At 285 volts, he emitted loud, agonized screams and cried out about experiencing heart pain. By the time by the time the voltage reached 330 volts, he remained completely silent. If you hesitated, Milgram had instructed the experimenter to respond with a series of cold robotic prods. Please continue. The experiment requires that you continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice. You must go on. Put yourself in the participant's shoes. You're sweating, heart racing. What would you do? Here's what one participant did. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. can't stand it. I'm not going to kill that man in there. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. 
Before the experiment, Milgram had asked a number of psychology students to predict the outcome. They estimated only about 1% would go all the way up to 450 volts. There would maybe be one person, one nutcase who might go all the way and kill the person in the room next door. The real results? 100% went up to 300 volts and 65% of participants went all the way up to 450 volts. Think about that. Picture being sat in a lecture hall of 100 of your fellow students. 65 of them might have delivered a fatal shock just because someone in a lab coat said so. And they weren't emotionless. Participants were sweating, trembling, stuttering, groaning, even digging fingernails into their skin. Some were invisible distress but they still obeyed 195 volts dance Milgram didn't stop there he carried out other variations of the study to see what makes obedience go up or down. Let's start with proximity, same room. In this variation, the teacher and learner were placed in the same room. The teacher would actually see the learner's expressions, the pain, the discomfort, the fear. And just that simple change, seeing the human impact, caused obedience to fall from 65% to 40%. Touch proximity. Then Milgram took it further. In this version, the teacher had to physically force the learner's hand onto a shock plate whenever they refused to answer. This made the violence much more personal. Obedience dropped even more, down to 30%. It's a lot harder to hurt someone when you have to do it with your own hands. Remote authority. But what happens if we increase the distance from authority instead of to the victim? In this version, the experimenter left the room and gave instructions over the phone. No lab coat in the room, no pressure from eye contact. The result? Obedience plummeted to 20.5%. So what's the pattern here? The closer we are to the victim and the further further we are from the authority figure, the less likely we are to obey. Next up, location. In the original study, everything took place at Yale University, a prestigious, respected institution. That setting alone carried authority. It felt scientific and trustworthy. But when Milgram moved the experiment to a run-down office building, obedience fell from 65% to 48%. So what changed? Same procedure, same experimenter, but a different setting one that felt less official, less credible. It turns out authority is often tied to context. As Milgram put it, we expose our throat to a man with a razor blade in the barber shop, but not in a shoe store. Where we are and how that place feels can change how much trust and obedience we're willing to give. Finally, let's talk about uniform. In the original study, the experimenter wore a gray lab coat, a simple outfit, but one that clearly signaled, I'm in charge. I'm a scientist, I know what I'm doing. In this variation, Milgram replaced the lab coat with everyday clothes. No uniform, no scientific appearance. What happened? Obedience fell sharply, from 65% to just 20%. Uniforms are powerful. They act as visual shortcuts for legitimacy. When we see a uniform, we often assume the person has authority, even when the orders they give go against our conscience. So how should we judge Milgram's study overall? It's easy to be shocked by the results, but from a scientific perspective, it's just as important to ask how well was the study actually done? One strength of Milgram's study is that it was conducted in a laboratory setting, which means it can easily be replicated, allowing the reliability of the findings to be assessed. In a controlled environment, it's easier to standardize procedures and control extraneous variables. For example, every participant received the same instructions and experienced the same setup, ensuring consistency across trials. This level of control also means that only the independent variable, the authority figure's presence and behaviour, is being manipulated, which helps to establish cause and effect. As a result, Milgram was able to draw causal conclusions about the effect of authority on obedience. The high level of control and replicability enhances the scientific credibility of the study. While Milgram's study was highly controlled and methodologically sound, it also raised serious concerns about how participants were treated. 
let's break down two of the biggest concerns. Deception. Participants were misled about the true purpose of the study. They believed it was about memory and learning, not obedience. Even more seriously, they thought they were administering real electric shocks to another person. That's a high level of deception and it had emotional consequences. Protection from harm. The stress experienced by participants was intense. Many were visibly distressed, sweating, shaking, stuttering, even having seizures. They genuinely believed they were causing serious harm and in that moment, the psychological impact was very real. But, and this is crucial, Milgram didn't simply leave participants to deal with that distress on their own. He took several steps to address their well-being. All participants were fully debriefed afterwards. They were reassured that their reactions were normal and understandable. And a follow-up study a year later found no signs of long-term psychological harm. In fact, 84% of participants said they were glad to have taken part. A surprising and telling statistic. It suggests that although the experience was difficult, many found it meaningful or valuable in hindsight. So was it unethical? By today's standards, yes. The levels of deception and distress would not meet current ethical guidelines. But at the time, formal ethical standards were still developing. And within that context, Milgram did make efforts to minimise harm and ensure participants were cared for after the fact. Milgram's study has also faced criticism for its lack of ecological validity meaning the setting and task might not reflect real-life situations where obedience occurs. While participants clearly believe the situation was real, the fact remains the study was conducted in a controlled laboratory environment with a very dramatic and direct command to harm another person. That's not how most obedience plays out in everyday life. In real world scenarios, obedience tends to be subtler and more complex. For example, we're more likely to face pressure from workplace hierarchies, social expectations, and bureaucratic systems, not a man in a lab coat telling us to administer electric shocks. Some argue the setup more closely resembles military style obedience, where orders are explicit and authorities formalized, which may limit how well the findings apply to everyday social contexts. Another common critique of Milgram's study is about who the participants were and whether they truly represent the wider population. This is because they were all male all from the United States, and all volunteers recruited through an advert in a newspaper. That last point matters. People who volunteer for psychological studies might be more willing to help, more curious, or even more compliant than the average person. And if that's the case, their behaviour under pressure might not reflect how everyone else would respond. These questions raise doubts about population validity, the extent to which Milgram's results apply beyond the group he studied. It's possible that obedience might look different across gender, culture and personality types and that's something later research has tried to explore. So now we know what people did in Milgram's study. But that leaves us with a much deeper question. Why? What was going on in the minds of those participants? How did they override their own conscience? What made some disobey and others go all the way to 450 volts? To watch that, you can click the video on the screen now. And for more resources to help you with psychology, don't forget to check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.